So first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Chris Hammond. Um, he is from the Ogden Clinic in Utah, so he's a local expert. Uh, we're really grateful for him joining us in person today. He is a dual board member certified in neurology and sleep medicine, whose professional interests include sleep disorders such as sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so welcome, Dr. Hammond. I appreciate the opportunity of being here and the invite, and uh, thank you for coming. And my focus today is to kind of give you a perspective of what a physician thinks um, for patients coming in with concerns related to particularly sleepiness, daytime sleepiness, and obviously that's our focus. And so uh, trying to understand sleepiness, trying to understand what it may mean, uh, especially perplexing. It still is among general physicians, I, I think, uh, as well as uh, everybody else. Uh, for those in the sleep world, though, we are gaining better and better understanding of sleepiness. And so I do want to go through definitions of what sleepiness is and what it means to people, patients, and, of course, what it means to physicians, particularly with sleep providers. Then also understanding why we sleep and the effects of sleep deprivation. And then, of course, a focus on central disorders of hypersomnolence. And, uh, and then, of course, our focus on idiopathic hypersomnia and what we know today. Not just uh, understanding that it represents sleepiness, but what we've identified are comorbidities, uh, associated problems, symptoms. So I, I do want to spend some time on that so we can understand that there, this is really... Uh, a syndrome of type, uh, not just sleepiness, right? And so I want to get that point across in, in a meaningful way. And then, of course, what can we do to stay awake? Um, how is sleepiness defined? There's, there's quite a, a spectrum, right? Uh, now, sleepy can be sleepy. I fall asleep. I can have a sleep attack right now. You might find me on the desk uh, or on the floor. And then that can be pretty obvious. Uh, for some, they may describe it as fatigue. But what is fatigue? Is it, uh, uh, is it physical? Is it mental or, or emotional? Am I just burned out one way or the other? Uh, same thing with tiredness. Well, I'm just tired of this job. Well, we, we use these terms in a, in a variety of ways um, to kind of express how we feel. But we know some of the limitations of our language, and that expression is certainly limited in that precise feeling of what we're experiencing in the moment or in general. Uh, lethargy. Uh, and then we go into medical terms with all of this, right? Now, the obvious things with sleepiness, okay, I can fall asleep at the opera. Uh, many of us may do. Not necessarily pathological, but may be concerning for our spouses, for example, here. Um, of course, we can have a hard day's work with a lot of eating and roaming, and we just want to chill on the beach. And so, you know, we just get fatigued and tired. That's the end of the day. Now, hypersomnolence is, is kind of a, a problem, though. It, we recognize it a problem among ourselves, uh, but a problem medically and social and, and social economically. And uh, so we know the impacts of hypersomnolence uh, in the occupational force among with our just personal lives. Uh, hypersomnia, a little bit different. It's understanding, well, we're certainly tired with hypersomnia, but these uh, people just like to sleep and any means of getting sleep. By the way, do you know the average, how long a cat sleeps in a 24-hour period? That can be 14, 16, 18 hours in a 24-hour period. They are hypersomniacs, if you didn't know that. Well, not really, but animals that like to sleep. Uh, and then, you know, chronic fatigue. How do we distinguish that from uh, sleepiness? Um, and, and there is a distinction. We actually, in the medical field, have guides and scores that help us distinguish chronic fatigue from other conditions, including sleep disorders. And with the myth of Sisyphus, we, you know, met, I think many of us have been here. So we, we have that idea of what fatigue is like. But for people that experience day after day pushing that rock up a mountain, 
uh, that seems to go nowhere and repeat the process, right? So we, we can all relate to some degree, but for some people, this is a regular and actually a, a detrimental problem to them quite often, but also can be quite vague in understanding uh, what causes chronic fatigue. And of course, we have many, many terms and medical diagnoses associated with chronic fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome. And then we have general just malaise, just from maybe medical problems, problems that we uh, just have in the flu um, or other chronic illnesses where we, we feel weak and tired. So further defining things, you know, what causes daytime sleepiness? Uh, we have a list, right? Many, many things. We're, we're, this is just a brief little summary. And so the common ones in our society clearly is insufficient sleep. And so with our modern day, with technologies and demands and culture, uh, we may just be simply sleep deprived. And that is the most common cause of sleepiness. So that includes modern day technologies with lights and, and phones and tablets and TVs that are running our, our workplace. Now, because of technologies, we have shift workers, right? People working nights and odd hours, swing shifts and so forth. And we have life, kids, young ones. And, and then we take excessive amounts of caffeine perhaps to push through that day. And we know that affects our sleep at night. So understanding that there is uh, uh, two major components in helping us sleep. We have circadian and we have sleep inertia. Sleep inertia is going to be relevant as we discuss things near the end of the topic. But uh, with those two physiological influences improving our sleep and maintaining sleep, they play a significant role. So any conflict with those elements, we're going to have difficulties maintaining sleep. My kid and I go back and forth with Chuck Norris jokes, so uh, bear with me. Um, fragmented sleep can be for other reasons. So other primary sleep, sleep disorders, uh, such as sleep apnea, snoring, maybe disturbing your partner's sleep, and, so, and a, a abundance of other sleep disorders, of course, that can fragment sleep. Um, circadian dysfunction, maybe it's our night owls, some are morning larks. Uh, but circadian dysfunction-related disorders is uh, better understood these days than when I was an adolescent, unfortunately. And, and so quite often, uh, for those uh, people that are not diagnosed, uh, especially adolescents, uh, they can have difficulties sleeping in class, especially in the mornings and other consequences. Uh, movement disorders or nocturnal movement disorders are relatively common. For example, periodic movements of sleep that can be disruptive. Of course, about 85% of those patients have restless leg syndrome that may inhibit sleep onset, uh, but uh, that carries through to periodic movements of sleep uh, that can also be uh, disruptive. So again, a plethora of problems uh, related to primary sleep disorders. Uh, that should be evaluated perhaps for any chief complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness. So then we have medical conditions. So chronic pain, bowel issues, dysmotility, bladder, uh, hormonal problems, especially reaching menopause, uh, uh, post-pubescence, uh, this list goes on. Cardiac issues, uh, proxismal arrhythmias that transpire at night that wake people up. And then an abundance of neurological problems too that uh, will hit a little bit. Mental health conditions, uh, a very, very well understood uh, uh, predisposition toward insomnia, perhaps, and of course, even daytime sleepiness, irrespective of quality or duration of sleep. Um, so we, we have to be uh, vigilant in assessing mood disorders, for example, and, and uh, bipolar disorder, for example, uh, we'll have swings of insomnia and then hypersomnolence and even hypersomnia as well. And then we have to take a look at medications, uh, an abundance of medications that may, can make us sleepy, tired, and some medicines that even we think put us to sleep that can have semi-withdrawal problems and keep us up at night. But importantly, it's understood that even some blood pressure medicines can make us tired all throughout the day. So we have to take a good look at medications. 
Now, why do we sleep? Of course, uh, uh, more and more science demonstrating and, and teaching us why we need sleep. I, I think it's just a, a well understood phenomenon. For those of us that get less than six hours of sleep, we suffer from problems. But the medical science is evolving to the point of understanding the necessity. Now, of course, uh, we look at deep sleep. We like deep sleep as sleep physicians. We measure deep sleep, referred to as N3 sleep. Uh, then we, we have an interest, too, in looking at the immune connection with deep sleep and, of course, hormonal regulation that transpires, including hormones that regulate appetite and others. Uh, metabolism, we understand pretty well with the uh, thermal regulation that transpires during sleep and maybe some survival or evolutionary components tied to that. And increased protein synthesis in deep sleep, we recognize. And maybe some of these substrates are crucial for not only growth, and we recognize that among uh, our young people and pediatric population, we, we depend on N3 or delta deep sleep uh, for growth and uh, among other uh, important elements in development. Uh, increased glucose uptake uh, stages in stage REM3 uh, and REM sleep listed here. And so we know it's, it may be helpful for procedure and declarative memory and problem solving. So sleep on it is kind of the adage. Uh, so we may actually find solutions to our problems during sleep. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of this a very uh, nice uh, chart explaining uh, so the, the sleep transmitters and wakefulness transmitters in sleep. But uh, that the point is, is to make it's very complex. And it's complex to the, the point that uh, any, any pathway uh, that we see here, if disrupted, can either keep us from sleeping or feel like we need to sleep more. So we go through several stages in sleep, and this is what we measure in the sleep lab. So a person gets hooked up to various electrodes, and we monitor what's called a hypnogram, as you see on the left side. The top representing REM sleep and the lower uh, portions representing that deep, what we just call now stage three sleep. And so we go through uh, stages and we like this deep sleep, that, that lowest part uh, that we see here. The more the better in short. What happens if we don't get that? Then feelings of uh, sleep deprivation as listed here, uh, mood, uh, cognitive uh, defects, uh, performance defects, the, the, the list goes on. Uh, health morbidity, healthcare costs, safety issues. Um, and, you know, we have actually pretty impressive figures with the cost of sleepiness, uh, but also the cost of life. Uh, attributed to what was speculated, the Three uh, Mile Island uh, disaster, uh, someone perhaps at least fatigued, if not sleeping on the job, uh, we don't know for sure. Chernobyl, I, I haven't seen the series, but I was told that it was attributed at least to some fatigue from a worker that was responsible there. Uh, and the, the Gulf uh, oil spill, likewise, attributed to fatigue. Uh, I think this was a, I think it was a Pan Am flight in the 90s. Uh, pilot fell asleep. And of course, we have multiple car crashes and fatalities as a consequence. So the list goes on, doesn't it? Now, disorders of central nervous system, before we get to disorders, uh, uh, central disorders of hypersomnolence. Now, sleepiness can be secondary, and as we reviewed many things, including primary neurological issues, traumatic brain injury, uh, having the multiple concussions puts people at risk of maybe persistent uh, brain injury problems. And, uh, and we know sleepiness or hypersomnolence is strongly tied to repeated TBIs. Multiple sclerosis, very, very common, we, so-called MS fatigue. And, and that's largely uh, a problem for them as opposed to sleepiness. But one study I participated with essentially uh, when you look at all sleep disorders in a multiple sclerosis patients, uh, you essentially double the risk. And uh, that includes narcolepsy, although I didn't look at specifically idiopathic hypersomnia, but we did find uh, narcolepsy was double risk for someone that has multiple sclerosis. 
Parkinson's disease, well understood, uh, even sleep attacks, prolonged naps, and so forth. Myotonic dystrophy, uh, very common hypersomnolence issues, migraine, usually either pre-drome or post-drome. So sometimes 12 or 24 hours, a person can just have a lot of sleepiness before their migraine. Patients may not recognize that. And then, of course, after migraine, also sleepiness. Epilepsy, very common. Uh, sometimes we blame it on medications, but not always. Uh, some people have nocturnal epilepsy, uh, seizures during their sleep that's disruptive, and that needs attention. Then we have dementia of all types, uh, Alzheimer's, vascular, many others that are associated with sleepiness. And then this last point, I'm gonna spend a little bit more attention to as we go through idiopathic hypersomnia. So regarding central disorders of hypersomnolence, uh, there's many that we know, well, few at least, and, and some we know better than others. So narcolepsy, uh, we understand fairly well in terms of pathomechanisms and, and pathways that lead to sleepiness and, and patients. Now, I just want to leave this graph up for a little bit, just again, understanding some of these complexities. And particularly with narcolepsy, we understand that there could be a neurotransmitter deficiency. Uh, but in the area of the brain, you might see around that green uh, blob where essentially you get connections uh, diffusely scattered all throughout the brain, brainstem then going up to what we call the cortex and involving several circuits or networks that do communicate with each other. So largely, we're, we're dependent on few uh, what we call uh, catecholamine or, or neurostimulator transmitters uh, to keep us awake. And this is a, a fair representation in terms of the idea of network connectivity uh, that's largely responsible in wakefulness. And uh, now, with narcolepsy, we, we have an idea that can be related to orexin deficiency, at least with type one narcolepsy. And type one narcolepsy tends to have more of these cardinal features that we see. And the hypnic related hallucinations, I, I, I kind of just, I like to leave it at that. Hypnopompic, hypnagogic hallucinations. I, most narcoleptics have both, and I just leave it as hypnic related hallucinations because it can be as we're going to sleep or waking up from sleep, very vivid dreams, intense moments, uh, sometimes associated with sleep paralysis. Uh, and sometimes sleep paralysis can have intrusions of these uh, strange dreams, right? They, they can be dreaming of their own room, very realistic, and then someone comes in or an animal intrudes and so forth. Um, I had a patient just yesterday uh, with sleep paralysis uh, with, without narcolepsy. Uh, but that was his chief complaint. Several times a week, he, he wakes up and, and no, no dreaming associated with that or even hallucinations, uh, but he can't move for minutes. Uh, several times a week in the absence of narcolepsy. So sleep paralysis can be on its own, and rarely you can get that with cataplexy as well, idiopathic cataplexy, but more times it's tied to narcolepsy because it's, a, it's an atonic, muscle atonic disorder. And so cataplexy is a feature cardinal with type one, um, and that may give us a diagnosis with other objective studies. But typically we're gonna have daytime sleepiness and sleep attacks associated. And then more recently, uh, in terms of one of the uh, leading cardinal features in number five, they listed poor nocturnal sleep quality. And something that's just generally misunderstood. We think narcoleptics should be sleeping very well all night without problems, 10, 12 hours, and that's just not generally the case. And a little bewildering too, because I can look at a sleep study and see 95 to 98% sleep efficiency. So to kind of give you an idea of what that means, that you can be in bed over seven hours uh, and, and sleeping close to seven hours of that, and you think, well, that's not a problem until you look at what we call microarousal, their index for how many awakenings. And generally, these are very brief awakenings, many, uh, quite often 20 to 30 per hour. And so what we call arousal index can be pretty substantial in narcoleptics. So again, something that's commonly misunderstood, that they do have poor quality sleep. Now, Klein-Levin, uh, not as common, fairly rare disorder. Uh, hallmarked by generally 
young adult men. I've only seen one in my clinic, um, I, and it was a very profound situation too because he came into my clinic uh, for an EEG uh, just because he would have these prolonged, essentially, sleep periods, terrible sleep inertia, profound, and where he was, people thought he was comatose. And so he came into my office for an EEG, and sure enough, when we completed the EEG, no seizures, but a whole lot of sleep, and I couldn't wake him up. And uh, it took a lot of poking and prodding, sternal rubbing, any, any painful stimulus we could do uh, to try to wake him up, and he would not wake up. So I had to call paramedics. I knew he was sleeping. In fact, I, I knew the condition he had from his previous history. And so, but uh, uh, by the time the paramedics came and, and put him in a gurney, he suddenly woke up in shock, as you can imagine. But so confusional arousals go with uh, Klein Levin. But it occurs in cycles, and they seem to outgrow this uh, for some reasons we don't understand. But prolonged hypersomnia in these patients. And I actually had a friend who actually is a carrier of, of, of Klein Levin um, with just minimal symptoms, a female, which we just don't see too often, but, uh, uh, but with a, kind of a minor version of symptoms. So idiopathic hypersomnia, this, this is uh, characterized again by excessive daytime sleepiness. We're not sure the prevalence, uh, more recent accounts probably looking at 20 to 50 people per million. Um, it seems to be more common in females. And uh, so I, I was thinking about this driving down. Um, for those online, welcome to Utah. So I'll have to introduce the Wasatch Front. So this is kind of a, a tight area geographically, uh, bordered by tall mountains on one side with great ski resorts, and then in addition to lakes on the other side. Great Salt Lake, Utah Lake, little space in between. But uh, we have this geographical border that kind of traps in uh, a vastly developing uh, area, uh, squeezing as many houses and people as we can. So in this little area, what we call the Salt Lake Valley, about one million people, and then uh, extending that to two different uh, counties, uh, what we call within the Wasatch Front, we have about two million people. Um, and so doing the math, if even considering the highest prevalence that I read, about 50 per 1 million, uh, that's only about 100 people. I don't think that's accurate. So uh, I posed the question before what the prevalence of idiopathic hypersomnia is. I, I think we're going to see more and under, as we're understanding as the technology improves. Of course, uh, there are more and more people than I think what most uh, journals account for in publications. It, it's just hard to recognize. It's, you know, again, and we'll go into this uh, also just by mischaracterization, misdiagnosis of these conditions. So this is an estimate that I think we're going to see increase over time. Typically, though, uh, by the time people are diagnosed, diagnosed, they're well into their 30s. Onset, though, typically adolescence, late adolescence, young adulthood, but it may take a few years to get the diagnosis. And retrospectively, we can identify uh, people, adults, likely experiencing these daytime sleepiness symptoms uh, well early into adolescence, uh, much like what we see with narcolepsy onset. Um, now, chronic uh, spontaneous remission, maybe this is reported. Um, I, I haven't seen that myself, but I've been in practice coming up 17 years, and so I, I may still be a little short on recognizing any, any spontaneous remission. Uh, so, symptoms, sleepiness, prolonged unrefreshing sleep, severe sleep inertia, cognitive impairment, long and unrefreshing naps, and that may be a distinguishing quality, not necessary, but from narcolepsy. And then autonomic complaints, and I, I find that interesting. So sleep inertia, a little bit about this. Well, difficulty awakening. I was telling my, uh, well, by the way, that patient, I think he's about 21, 22 years old. Um, you know, profound sleep inertia. It was a different condition, but uh, I, I could not wake him up. And of course, uh, I've had many patients uh, tell me, 
likewise, or rather their family members, you know, they, they can throw cold water on their face. And uh, they may wake up, but they may wake up what we call sleep drunkenness. I just call it confusional arousals. And so it may take quite a bit of time to fully wake up. So minutes to hours, and it can be a challenge, especially trying to get our adolescent uh, kids to school. So occurs in 36 to 66 of pe percent of people with idiopathic hypersomnia, so pretty common, probably a higher. Long sleep time, so we, we kind of define this as short or rather long sleepers with hypersomnia uh, as opposed to regular, but it's quite often we can find maybe in about a quarter to half of these people have prolonged sleep, and it, that uh, generally around 11 hours or more in a 24-hour period. And most of the time, if they're allowed, that's consolidated, but quite often, then it's a very prolonged nap. Otherwise, that can be two, three, four hours sometimes or more. So, and, and in general, again, as referred to prior, these people remain sleepy despite prolonged sleep times. And that's one of the hallmarks that I can identify in my clinic of recognizing these patients are very sleepy despite quality sleep. And, you know, and it, it's interesting to me, I'll get the chief complaint, I just don't sleep well at night, doc. Well, then we have to examine, right? Well, what do you mean by not sleeping well? Because you report here you sleep eight to 10 hours. Are, are you waking up often? No, 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 I, I just don't sleep well. Well, what are you really telling me? What they're telling me, that as I, we eventually find out, is that they're tired. And so they, they attribute to that as just not sleeping well, okay. But they're getting sufficient sleep, and, uh, but they feel tired. So that, that's kind of a challenge. And unfortunately, patients that go to their provider with this chief complaint, well, you're not sleeping well, here's some trazodone, or here's an Ambien. And we know what that's gonna do to them. So we can go kind of backwards, right? We're not understanding the problem. Um, and unfortunately, go in the wrong direction with treatment. Naps, I mentioned, they can be quite prolonged, uh, usually over an hour, and very common among those with hypersomnia. Um, again, as I pointed out, it can be a distinction between those with narcolepsy in general. Uh, that there's no straight rule with this, but often with narcoleptics, at least, they can have refreshing or restorative sleep naps and at least feel better for a little bit. Not typically the case for those that have hypersomnia. Cognitive impairment, 82% of patients with a hypersomic experience brain fog, and, and that seems to be a buzzword lately, especially with COVID. Um, and, and so, but uh, very, very common among those in, with neurological conditions of a variety, but including hypersomnia. So often that's short-term memory loss, and, and largely this is composed of inattention, by the way. They don't have a primary cognitive deficit I, I just want to make that point. There's not like an area of the brain that their memory cells are impaired. This is not like any of the dementias, Alzheimer's, and so forth. This is largely inattention, what I call attentional network disruption. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, so as described here, you know, 79% short-term memory loss, um, feeling of one mind's going blank, you know, brain fog in general. Um, of course, we make mistakes if we're not attentive. Um, and it's difficult, too, to recall memories, and it's difficult to form memories if we're not attentive, if we're tired, if we're in this brain fog. Have anybody done that? I've, I've been there. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so a little bit of autonomic dysfunction, uh, because uh, this is a phenomenon I, I am so happy to see described in publications because I've been experiencing this for years. And in fact, even when I, I was a resident, uh, and this is long before, uh, I'm, I'm old, um, long before idiopathic hypersomnia was described. Um, we had a, a very vague description back then. But uh, I, I, I saw this phenomenon and, and uh, neurological characteristics of these patients that were incredibly tired, but they also dealt with a lot of other issues. And they had headaches, they had migraines, um, they had also 
a lot of dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, something we call orthostatic intolerance. That means when we stand up, we feel lightheaded, dizzy. Um, essentially reflecting uh, often a drop in our blood pressure, or it could be an increase in heart rate that corresponds. And just a lack of compensation with our circulation one way or the other. So it can be uh, due to vascular collapse or an increased heart rate trying to compensate one way or the other, our body's telling us that something's wrong, and it may be something related to the autonomic nervous system function. And so, so very common, 32% to 48% of these patients, some have some level of orthostatic intolerance. Perception of temperature dysregulation, I'm hot, I'm cold, it's, it's back and forth. Uh, I have to deal with this in my household quite often, and it's not menopause, I, I, I have... <laughs> Uh, a couple family members with this condition, and so it's a, it's a challenge to manage. Uh, peripheral vascular complaints, Renaud's type, cold hands, cold feet. This is very common. So what we see in terms of numbers, that temperature dysregulation, oh, this is a, a nice study. Uh, of course, we, we only have so many people with hypersomnia, but based on questionnaires, uh, uh, observational studies, 25% of these patients have temperature dysregulation, uh, 46 cold extremities, uh, feeling of faintness in 32%, and digestive problems. Largely, this is hypomotility, uh, slowness of the bowels, constipation is common, uh, 22, and then palpitations of 23% of patients. And, and that's what are essentially referring to postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. You've heard of that? So that palpitation is awfully related to orthostatic change or, or from sitting to standing or been walking for a while. So when you look at controls, these are controls means a healthy people, essentially, a substantial increase of these autonomic symptoms that may reflect autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And then what about others? So we do have a tie into many other sleep disorders, as I mentioned, and they, if you look at idiopathic hypersomnia, uh, a, a common disorder is sleep apnea. Not just obstructive sleep apnea, but also central sleep apnea, which is interesting. But sleep apnea, you know, very, very common. And, and this is often a diagnostic challenge among providers uh, because you have someone that obviously has narrow airway, they're obstructing their airflow when they sleep. Okay, so we, give, we do a sleep test and it demonstrates sleep apnea. So we put them on CPAP and sure enough, uh, we can follow data, we can see good outcomes, it opens their airway, they look really good on number, but they're still sleepy. So their doctor says, well, I, I don't know why you're sleepy, the numbers look good, your sleep apnea is cured, I've done my job, good luck. And that's a problem because we do under appreciate idiopathic hypersomnia as maybe a, a comorbid situation with sleep apnea. Mood disorders, as mentioned, a lot of depression, anxiety with patients with hypersomnia. Depressive is seen at 31%, anxiety at 30%. And then what about other metabolic issues, including dyslipidemia? And they tend to have higher cholesterol. Is that, uh, how is that related? Is it secondary to lifestyle activity? Don't know. Headaches and migraines, as mentioned. Uh, the other population only was 7%, and it's probably <laughs> limitations of the study, but I'm a little skewed as a neurologist. I see a lot of headaches, but even still, even within my population of hypersomniacs, yeah, very, very common. I would say every one of my hypersomniac has migraine. I listed here about 24%. Diabetes, a little higher than the, the other population, and cardiovascular disease. So we have comorbidities. So the consequences, as mentioned, with just general sleepiness, but uh, this is a, a, an article, too, that was interesting, looking at uh, social impairments, uh, looking at work, occupational problems, seen at 75% of patients, and just in general, impaired social life at 98%. Uh, sexual activity, negatively affected, uh, related to several medical physiological factors as well as social factors. Breaking up, 32%. Alarm purchase, I, I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> I don't think it applies too much in these days, but 
yeah, I've had many patients having to buy three, four, six alarms to get up, you know, so. Anybody got the boom box? Uh, actually, boom alarm, it's a sonic boom, I should say. Yeah, it's, it's a great one, but these days we got the wonderful technologies. Um, and then challenges, the treatment, of course, and, and this is part for the course with the hypersomnia, seen at 25% of patients. The pathophysiology, thank you. Um, we have very poor descriptions, uh, understanding the root cause of idiopathic hypersomnia. So speculating at a system network dysfunction, however, and how it originates, we just don't know, but perhaps GABAergic related, this GABA system. Now GABA is a part of the more uh, uh, calming, sedentary, uh, sedating uh, neurotransmission uh, as, it, as it networks throughout the brain. We know during sleep, the GABAergic pathways flip on and then of course the catecholamine or the stimulating pathways flip off. And so what we've identified so far in a few hypersomnia patients is looking at certain parts of the brain that may be affected as a consequence. But this remains to be explored. How do we diagnose hypersomnia? Well, it uh, these days requires sleep testing. Now, of course, we wanna rule out other sleep disorders and like mentioned, the sleep apnea, a common cause. We do need to treat that. And then, uh, but we have to do a, a multiple sleep latency test. And we have certain criteria to help uh, achieve that. And that includes we're falling asleep on average of five naps. By the way, if you're not familiar with MSLTs, it's a daytime sleep test, usually followed by a nighttime. And the nighttime sleep test looks fine. No sleep and your major problems. We get at least six hours of sleep. Then we keep patients over for a daytime sleep test, five nap trials, separate by two hour intervals. And then we, what we do, dark room, quiet, go to sleep. We measure how long it takes to get to sleep on those five nap trials. And then we also look for REM, early REM. And that's helpful for the assessment of narcolepsy. So if we don't have a lot of REM, or at least we have less than two REM onset periods, during the MSLT, and we have an average latency of eight minutes or less, then we may have the electrographic diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. It has to be applied clinically. What does that mean? Well, we're getting sufficient sleep, so otherwise, you know, if we're getting less than six hours, we just call it insufficient sleep syndrome. Now, if a person has cataplexy, then we might still need to think about narcolepsy, even if we don't see all those REM intrusions on the daytime test. And uh, then, of course, we have to look at medicines and everything else medical. So at least three months of sleepiness, we have a positive MSLT, say six minutes, and we don't see any REM intrusions coming through. And I have a patient that's sleeping 10 to 12 hours most days, probably is idiopathic hypersomnia, excluding all the other many factors that may contribute to sleepiness. But sleep testing is a challenge, and we know the limitations. So a lot of us have to put on our clinical hats and play Dr. House. My medical student reminded me uh, day before yesterday, uh, wasn't it wonderful to be able to break into somebody's home and see how they live? If you've ever seen the episodes of Dr. House, physicians breaking in people's homes and doing some investigation. What we do is very unnatural. We put people in the sleep, we'll have them tell them to sleep. So we understand limitations. Uh, of testing, and but so we have to again put on our clinical hat and, and make a determination. So just an example of polysomnography, what we'd see on sleep testing, and this is someone that had just a mild case of, of sleep apnea, and you're actually looking at REM sleep here. Now just to give you an example of the multi-parameter assessment, looking at uh, breathing, oxygen, heart rate, and of course electroencephalography. Treatment, a uh, couple of minutes here. I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but of course we need sufficient quality sleep, uh, scheduled naps if beneficial, but unfortunately with idiopathic hypersomnia, not as quite as beneficial and sometimes a detriment, uh, unfortunately, as compared to narcoleptics where naps can be beneficial. But if it helps, great, uh, then let's schedule those in. We do have FDA approved therapy, Oxibate, uh, also known as Zywave. 
Um, weight promoting agents, otherwise off labeled usage of modafinil, armodafinil, pitolysin, uh, solar infantil, and caffeine, good old standard. Uh, uh, and then mood stabilizing agents sometimes use also, again, not FDA approved, but venlafaxine, bupropiona, fluoxetine, protriptyline, I, I've never used that, or selegiline. Uh, but uh, there are a few studies uh, supporting them, but very, very small studies across the board with any of these off-labeled agents, by the way. It just means they're not FDA approved. We just have the one therapy that was only FDA approved. And then, of course, you can find trials uh, and anecdotal reports of various things, including uh, carnitine, clarithromycin, uh, some of these other esoteric therapies get a little complicated, but where we get desperate. Uh, but then, of course, traditional amphetamine salts. So, of course, other things are, again, if it helps, great. If it's diet, if it's exercise, I encourage that anyway. I think it's just a natural stimulant, meditation, light therapy in question. And then addressing some of these autonomic issues. So many causes of a hypersomnolence, just be aware, these are central disorders of hypersomnia uh, uh, that we've reviewed, I think are important to identify as provider, and then, of course, as family, uh, as an individual, maybe you need to ask questions. Uh, associated with sleep inertia, that can be profound. It can have sleep attacks, uh, sometimes mimicking narcolepsy. But generally, these are, are patients that have uh, non-restorative uh, sleep times and still have the profound uh, sleepiness. And as we reviewed, hypersomnia has an impact on the autonomic nervous system. It has an impact on, of course, the workplace and social issues and so forth. And so we've identified it can be difficult to diagnose or recognize in people. We've identified that it can be difficult to treat uh, until more recently we uh, have an FDA approved therapy. And uh, so in, in one case, I, I just quickly before, before I finish up, uh, a patient uh, yesterday I, I think this is the, the prototypical, I hate to say that, but this uh, uh, a good representation of what we see in the clinic. She was 32 years old, um, and uh, she, I actually asked her to come see me because I was just looking at a sleep test and, and very clearly uh, and, and diagnosed as idiopathic hypersomnia. But talking to her before I, break, I broke the diagnosis, she told me it's just a, a, essentially a lifelong struggle of... Uh, trying to stay awake in high school, uh, of sleeping in classes and barely graduating, you know, not having any social life whatsoever. Of course, getting reprimanded by teachers, parents, you know, the difficulties getting up in the morning. It was always a fight and a struggle. And all the way through college, I don't know how she got through college, but she made it through, pushed her way through, and now is a mother of three children uh, who feels her children, safety is at risk. And I listen to her and I can understand, you know, her, her concern. She's afraid of her children um, not being well taken care of or uh, coming into harm's way because she's the, the sole care uh, giver of her children and no one else to rely on. And so I heard this story and, and, and going with the diagnosis when I, when I broke it to her, tears, you know, she just started crying. Oh, boy, this is terrible. I'm so sorry. But she's like, no, no, no. Uh, the tears of joy in a way, I guess. She, she was just so relieved, uh, knowing that she wasn't crazy, uh, she wasn't lazy, uh, that she has a sleep medical condition. And so, of course, the, the good news was, well, this is very treatable. And we're going to work through this. And uh, you're going to find some normality. And, uh, and importantly, you're going to take care of your kids. So anyway, uh, that, that pretty much concludes my presentation. Now, of course, always be careful with what you ask for, though. So but if you have any questions, I think, are we doing that at the yes, end? Thank you. There. Thank you very much for that very informative presentation. We do have some questions for you. Um, some are online, but first of all, anyone in the room that would like to ask Dr. Hammond a question? Okay. Yes, Diane. I'm uh, just wondering what you think will improve people like your patient who finally got diagnosed. What's going to improve the referrals? Sorry, improve the referrals to you so we get people getting diagnosed sooner. 
Well, an excellent question. Um, I was on a campaign, if you recall, about uh, 16 years ago before the, the anti-opiate campaign has come out from a medical perspective. Uh, you know, understanding that a lot of uh, physicians, providers, uh, just not understanding complications of opiates at the time. And from a sleep perspective, I was seeing a lot of problems with their breathing. <laughs> And, and so uh, we did what we can to help physicians identify the complications and to ensure their patients got proper treatment. Not that I had anything against opiates, but I had everything against physicians not recognizing the complications, including respiratory suppression that end up killing a lot of people. Ultimately, it comes down to provider education, in other words. And because I was out there knocking on doors, I was out there educating, it took some time. It, it's a campaign, isn't it? It takes time to educate and to inform providers of, of, of this condition, uh, especially. And, but also uh, important to know that the life impact, unfortunately, even among physicians, among my own colleagues, and, and uh, you know, even in my own profession, <laughs> uh, they don't want to deal with it. And uh, I scratched my head at the same time because identifying, of course, treating this condition, I, I think is life-saving, at least life-altering, but it can be life-saving as, as we see uh, the social economic impacts uh, of, of sleepiness. So uh, to your point, I, I wish I, what we're doing here and today and what we're trying to do in terms of further education and promoting, I, I, I don't know what more we could do other than um, making services available. And then that's a challenge in our medical field as well. Uh, sleep labs can be out three, six months. Turnover can be quite uh, prolonged. So we can do a lot, on, like on my end of things, to, to assist patients with the diagnosis. And of course, the, the availability of sleep physicians is minimal. And also patients just waiting for consultation could be six months or more. And so that is a problem, I think, uh, uh, nationwide, and I think locally, I, I think with education, contacting providers, and doing the best we can in clinics for uh, assessment and treatment. Uh, but do you have other ideas? Hypersomnia Foundation. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, uh, it's the work of the Hypersomnia Foundation, really. Uh, but yeah, it's it's disheartening how little education apparently medical students get on sleep. And um, I think the Hypersomnia Foundation now has a physician continuing education video. Um, so, yeah. Terrific. Good stuff. Okay. Hi, I, I have a lot of questions, so here's one. <laughs> um, I understand that we have a very short time of, I mean, lower time of deep sleep compared to a normal person. So I wonder if, if does it take longer for us to recover from surgeries, for example, since the deep sleep is the time of, you know, where cells regenerate, but mm -hmm. also for like physical therapy, things, things like that. Does it take longer to us? Well, that's a good question in terms of actually maybe referring to immunology, um, uh, the, the innate adaptive immuno cells. Uh, helping recover with inflammation and infections and so forth. That, that we see across the board comorbidities increase, but with that specific to post-operative complications, I don't have data for it, so I don't know for sure. Uh, Maybe implied. Now, in, in short, in lifestyle, though, some things I didn't mention, you know, I kind of brushed over lifestyle, you know, some things that we know can contribute and aggravate our hypersomnia. I bet you some of you can mention, what are some things that aggravate your hypersomnia? Stress. All right. Stress is emotionally taxing. I, I'm, I'm a product of this. <laughs> some people, uh, they get stressed, uh, they can get uh, anxious and uh, overactive. I just want to sleep. <laughs> I can just sleep the rest of the day and the night, right? That's, that's stress. Yeah, I'm a sleeper. I can easily sleep off that stress. What else? So I have a question. So sure. I moved here to Utah uh, July of 21 and have been trying to find a sleep doctor. I didn't know you were in Ogden, and now I do. Um, just, I guess, uh, 
figure out if there's a way that we can kind of have, I know Hypersomnia has a website, a hyper, uh, like a tab or something on the website to kind of help find sleep doctors, but just something to kind of have a more like comprehensive or a way to look up of, hey, I'm here and have a better way of being able to find a sleep doctor in the area that you're living in. Yeah, so as pointed, yeah, the foundation, I think, uh, will be a, a helpful resource identifying clinicians that can be helpful for that. Um, yeah, regarding lifestyle, too, I, I think uh, alcohol is probably one. Uh, if alcohol is a, a sedative, right? It's GABAergic, and idiopathic hypersomniacs have enough GABAergic activity going on. Um, exercise as a stimulant in, inhibits GABA in one sense. Um, and in others, it improves quality of sleep as well. And so regular exercise, uh, I'm, I condone and encourage patients to, for something that's a very graduated uh, process because in the beginning, we might feel no motivation. Um, and it can be a challenge to get up and move and, and to incorporate something on routine so we can do on a regular basis. So a very graduated exercise program, I, I do encourage. And then, of course, other dietary issues, only if you identify problems that may add to the sleepiness. For some people, it's a heavy carb meal, and that may affect all of us to some degree, just more so with people with uh, hypersomnia. Gluten sensitivities, we may not have all the antibodies to pick up these, but if, you, if gluten makes you tired, then avoid it. So what I tell my patients is just to experiment, trial and error, try these different diets, see what works best for you, and then try the exercise. What's important too is the right timing of exercise. Is it morning? Maybe not, maybe it's a little later. Uh, for my purposes, I have to work out at noon, and instead of uh, guzzling down a, a gallon of Mountain Dew to get through the afternoon, I, I go for a run. And, and so things like that, you just have to kind of self-experiment and see what uh, fits in your lifestyle, of course. Okay, thank you. We, we have quite a lot of questions online, so I'll try. Um, first of all, is IH a rare disease? Yes. Well, so they say. <laughs> That was a short, that was a short question and a short answer. We're going to see it answer. come from rare to something that's probably more uh, obviously understood and, and hopefully accepted. But uh, I, I do believe we're going to see bigger numbers as, as, as you guys, as the word gets out. Absolutely. Yeah. Is IH a disorder or a disease? Yeah. And so uh, disease implied pathophysiology identified, you know. Uh, we were calling narcolepsy what a syndrome uh, for so long. Um, until recognizing uh, the, the path of mechanisms behind it. Uh, I, so maybe semantics, uh, understanding disease syndromes, symptoms, and so forth, uh, and how we classify things as researchers or physicians, there, there's quite a bit of variability with that. Um, in terms of the disease state, I, I, I don't think it will take too long before we start to understand the, the more specific mechanisms involving the process of things. As of now, it is kind of a syndrome, a constellation of problems, but clearly we, we do have objective studies that can at least validate the condition. And, and so in terms of these semantics, I, I don't get too involved with those. Uh, fortunately, you know, with uh, translational science uh, and sleep medicine, we, we have therapeutics to help out regardless. So I'll call it a disease if that helps, but. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we, that's people with IH, have less or more deep sleep compared to healthy people? Uh, less deep sleep compared to healthy? Uh, overall, what we see is essentially kind of neutral in terms of percentages, uh, in terms of actually quantity, we actually can get more. So another, another phenomenon that's not well understood. Uh, but they, they tend to uh, preserve sleep architecture fairly well. Now, across the board, we're going to see N1 and 2 light sleep uh, more pronounced. Uh, but then, then you look at any measures of deep sleep. Uh, uh, studies have varied. Uh, some have, sh uh, have shown less. Uh, some have shown essentially neutral. So I, I don't think we're recognizing this as a, a deep sleep issue per se. Um, and so in terms of sleep architecture, we certainly don't see the features like we would with narcolepsy. Uh, we don't get the early REM uh, or a little or fragmented REM sleep like we see with narcolepsy. Uh, but in short, with hypersomnia, 
Uh, I'm not sure if we can pinpoint sleep architecture as a, as a pivotal explanation, uh, at least for symptoms. Thank you. And Jules asks, how can someone go about getting a diagnosis for dysautonomia after an IH diagnosis has already been established? Well, that's a good question. Uh, dysautonomia is often a, a clinical assessment. Now, we can do very specific neurophysiological studies for dysautonomia. A common one is what we call a tilt table. And so this may be something your provider can look into for assessment, for example, of either postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or orthostatic hypotension. Um, so what we do is essentially uh, keep a person flat on the table in a very gradual increase at the head of the bed. And, and so it's just a kind of like a ramp or a, a, an angle and to, in attempts to reproduce symptoms. And it could be objectively measured through heart rate and blood pressure and with some chemical addition, we see what the response is. And that may be a helpful diagnosis. Um, quite often, I do it clinically. Neurophysiological studies it can be challenging. And we know even here in Salt Lake City, it can be more than six months to get those done. Mm -hmm. So I, I do take a clinical preview. And so if I identify symptoms that sound uh, automatic related, autonomic uh, neuro dysfunction of some sort, and then I, we proceed with uh, not just the diagnosis, then of course management. And management of dysautonomia, we, we, we do have quite a few options to help with those symptoms. Thank you. We've got five more minutes and a few more questions. Um, so Beth asks, my daughter was diagnosed with IH by sleep study and MSLT, but it was done while she was on an SNRI, which can suppress REM. She is positive for the genetic markers for narcolepsy, does this raise any doubts about the diagnosis of IH versus narcolepsy type 2, and does it matter? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> does it matter? Well, um, so, I would argue yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, so, so for the, the assessment of narcolepsy, we often tell patients to withhold from certain medications two weeks prior to their MSLT. Uh, that may include, as, as mentioned, medicines that are antidepressants. So that class of medicine characteristically composes of alterations in serotonin and even alterations of norepinephrine. And many of these are reuptake inhibitors that promote essentially more neurotransmission that can inhibit REM sleep. And that, that's usually the primary concern. And so if patients haven't uh, withdrawn uh, uh, from these antidepressants, and then that could influence outcomes on the MSLT, meaning it could suppress the REM sleep. So we don't have what we call sleep onset REM periods, which is a, one of the cardinal manifestations electrographically on MSLT for narcolepsy. And so with that in mind, uh, for a lot of our patients, uh, for whatever reason, they didn't stop their antidepressant. We may have to repeat that for the diagnosis of narcolepsy, but again, with strict abstinence of any, anything related to REM inhibition. Um, does that play a role in terms of treatment, uh, in terms of we have a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy? The answer is yes. Um, right now with the FDA approval, we do have more options uh, treating narcolepsy. Uh, with oxabate therapy, the, the single FDA approved therapy for in, in hypersomnia, we also use for narcolepsy. But in terms of requirement of weight promoting agents, stimulants and so forth, we do have more options treating with narcolepsy at the present. Mm. That actually leads to our next question. Um, if IH isn't a deep sleep issue, then why would a medication like Zywave be approved to treat IH? Would it really help? Yeah, that, that, that is interesting. And mechanisms regarding uh, oxabate therapy, we, we know from Z uh, Zyram studies treating narcolepsy that it substantially promotes delta, uh, delta N3 or deep sleep. Uh, whereas narcolepsy, it's very clear they get uh, deficiencies of N3 sleep. Um, and, and so we've postulated the mechanism of Zyrem or oxabate therapy back in the day was inducing more deep sleep, hence patients waking up with better or more restored sleep. The mechanisms involving idiopathic hypersonia remain to be uh, elucidated. I, I don't know. Again, we can have many hypersomniacs that have less deep sleep and three sleep. And so, of course, that's the postulated mechanism as far as we know, but we, I don't think we quite understand. Jacqueline asks, I was diagnosed with AD, ADD as an adult. 
could this actually be part of the cognitive impairment from IH? I think that's a very good point. Uh, if a person's been diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, um, I, I, my opinion, now I, I do believe there, there's primary ADD out there. I, I don't want to disparage any society or any people that have suffered from it for a long time. But I, I'm definitely skewed or biased and, and believe a lot of these conditions or symptoms of ADHD can be a, a primary sleep disorder that needs attention. So absolutely, I, I think we need attention to look at these primary sleep disorders, including idiopathic hypersomnia. So it can be confusing because for primaries, especially with young people where ADHD is so common anyway, but the important things to look at is especially in onset and adolescence or young adult years, uh, there can be a million and one things that cause, and I refer to as a attentional network dysfunction. I don't even diagnose people with ADD. <laughs> I just call it inattention or attentional network because I think we need to look. And, and so, yes, absolutely, looking for IH, looking for other sleep conditions is imperative. Mm. David asks, is there concern with IH and undergoing surgery requiring general anesthesia? Oh, uh, a very good question as we alluded to uh, the contributing factors. Anything GABAergic, right? Uh, we talked about alcohol. We have to be careful with medicines that are GABAergic. And then, of course, anesthesia is largely GABAergic. And, and so that kind of promotion, I, I think advising or, or rather informing your anesthesiologist or surgeon or proceduralist is imperative uh, because I think... Uh, we, we may have to be ready for such profound sleep inertia or confusional arousals with that GABAergic effect. So that's just a matter of precaution. And I think uh, uh, informing your providers that you have this condition, uh, if they don't understand, we can help them understand that there could be uh, a prolonged, pronounced sleep inertia as a consequence to their anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are more questions, but I think we're out of time. So thank you again, Dr. Hammond, okay, for thank you your very presentation. Much.